You're listening to the Running in Production podcast, where developers and engineers talk about their tech stacks, lessons learned, and general tips from running web apps in production. Here's Nick and today's guest. Welcome to Running in Production. Today I'm with Gabriel Robertson, who is running Phoenix in production, and Phoenix is a web framework written in Elixir. Gabriel, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me on. Sure. Uh, do you want to start off by introducing yourself and letting people know a little bit about the app that we're going to be talking about today? Uh, sure. My name is Gabriel Robertson. I've uh, started my work Elixir project uh, back in mid-2016. Uh, didn't really uh, do a whole lot with it before then. It was still fairly new uh, before then as well. But I'd been running a lot of Erlang frameworks before that. So it was mostly my first big foray into Elixir, whereas before that, I'd only done a few smaller Elixir things. Nice. Don't you love when it works out like that, where you can just learn on, on the job? Very much. There was, technically wasn't a whole lot to learn. It was mostly just learning the framework. Elixir, the language, was... It's Erlang with a different skin, so it was trivial to pick up. <laughs> right. So are you the only developer on that project, or do you have a small team? I'm the only developer on that project. The... Uh, college I work at only has two real programmers, I guess you could say. By real, I mean the others just mostly do SQL to generate reports and so forth. So, eh. So have you ever called them like not a real developer to their face? Uh, that's their own terminology. <laughs> <laughs> they like the world of GUIs. <laughs> right. So you mentioned uh, 2016. So now we're in almost the end of 2019. So has that app been running in production for like three plus years now? It was first initially deployed a few months thereafter. It was running for about six to eight months when I wasn't quite happy with the design. So it was basically rewritten. And by rewritten, I mean most of the Phoenix parts were rewritten. Most of the backend application framework is in other separate libraries, so they were just brought back in. Uh, so the whole Phoenix side of the interface was rewritten in uh, early to mid-2017. And it's been running that version ever since. Oh, wow. So it's definitely been around the block a couple of years. That's great. So I guess, like, what what motivated you to use Elixir and Phoenix in the first place? I know you had experience with Erlang, but is there some, like, component of the application that just fit really well with that model? Uh, for Phoenix, the way it worked was very clean. Like, initially... Uh, people would look at it and it looks like it might have a bit of magic, but it really doesn't. It's just a lot of tiny parts built on each other, which made it exceptionally simple to understand. And that was the main reason I decided to grab it. Right. So were there any other questions that you asked yourself beforehand, or are you just basically based it on that? Uh, well, other considerations I made were just some Erlang frameworks. Uh, Yaz was always a big consideration. Uh, I've used it multiple times in the past. Um, the overall performance I needed wasn't a big issue, so Yaws would have been fine. But it was also fairly old in how it did a lot of things. It didn't follow modern standards, especially in regards to database handling. It was just very low level. Um, but uh, eh, I mostly just worked a lot with that. Uh, Cowboy was uh, just using Cowboy straight was an option. Uh, nitrogen was always fun to play with. I loved making things in Nitrogen, an old Erlang framework. It was just fun to program in, uh, but it is a little more magical than what I would really prefer for a release product. <laughs> so that's mostly why I didn't pick it. I've also used C++ frameworks in the past, uh, everything from uh, witty to just low-level HTTP APIs. Um, also considered a couple of Python things just barely started looking at Rust at the time, but I didn't want to learn a whole new language at the time either. So that's what uh, I just eventually ended up settling on Phoenix. Hmm. So I've actually never heard of Yas before. Is that like um like a Phoenix comparable framework for Erlang or something else? Uh, Yas is huge. Uh, let me bring it up here real quick. So the Yas Erlang web server, it is ancient. <laughs> I first started messing with it in the early 2000s, so it's been around for near 20 years now at the very least. Um, oh, wow. But it's a framework which just, it's one of those do-everything frameworks. It is comprehensive. Um, if you so is it, more, is it like a Rails type of thing, or, 
or no? I've never actually used Drill, so I can't really say, but it's expansive. It has a lot of stuff built in. So as long as your program can fit in its model well, it works very well. Even if it can't, you can still piece it apart pretty well. Right. That sounds very much like batteries included. So like the Rails slash Django model where, you know, the framework tries to do a whole bunch of stuff. And it works really good if it fits, but if it doesn't fit, then it's like, eh, you spend all this time trying to, you know, get around things there. It's a very clean framework, though. I quite like it. You can do a lot with very little code, like less than Phoenix. <laughs> right. I mean, if you, let's say that you rewrote your app again today from scratch, you know, two or three years later, uh, would you still go with Phoenix or would you choose something else? I love the Phoenix framework itself. I'm still torn on Elixir in a way. Uh, I've been hugely a fan of statically typed languages. Static typing catches the vast majority of my own bugs. <laughs> so just by using a static programming language and using proper type-based programming, uh, most bugs that I encounter routinely in my Elixir projects just categorically cannot happen. At that point, it's mostly just my own logical faults and things after that. So nowadays, what I... Uh, it really depends on what I'm wanting to do. Okay. It's very, very clean for wanting to do a lot of very dynamic content. So if I was doing a site like that, I would probably still use it. But I would probably try a lot harder to shoe in some more static typing layers, like Gradualizer uh, that's coming out. Uh, it's basically a much more strongly typed dialyzer. Or dialyzer. Uh, right. But it's... It is something that can really get that static typing I'm looking for. So if it settles down well and it works really well in the Elixir ecosystem, which it looks like it will, I have a little gradual Elixir wrapper around it that you can use to run it on the Elixir projects, then that would fix most of the issues I have with Elixir just right off the bat. The rest of Elixir, everything from the documentation, the tooling, to how well it maps to Erlang, to the entirety of the beam it runs on, that all works perfect. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of Elixir and Phoenix as well. But I do not have any experience using a, a statically typed language for more than just like screwing around with. But uh, I do definitely see the appeal of that. And, you know, if you use guards and stuff like that with Elixir, you can sort of kind of get some of that behavior, but it's way different than just having the compiler catch it every time. Yeah, the difference between runtime compared to compile time bug catching is significant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So earlier you mentioned, or maybe hinted at, um, your application that you're developing. Is is it more of like a monolith or no, right? It sounds like there may be other services running in the background using different languages. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? What started this project is I was initially hired to get all of the disparate things at the place working together. Uh, they use a, an Oracle backend database to store everything. Um, that Oracle database isn't easily accessible to anything else, mostly for security reasons and so forth. Right. But every department, and there are a lot of departments at a college, uh, all like to have their own data, their own extra things added in. Uh, they want even just pulling things like student phone numbers. They can't really pull that from the, from the central Oracle database just because of access permissions. So everyone has their own copies. So some things are more updated. Other things are not updated. And I was initially brought in to get everything under one umbrella, I guess you could say. Uh, so my thing talks with the Oracle database. It has a site uh, PostgreSQL database uh, to store all the other extra data. And it just puts everything into a single interface. So for example, the um, health departments, uh, we have a huge nursing program. Uh, they do things very uniquely. It does not fit into the college Oracle database whatsoever. So that was my first big task, was basically rewriting all of their things, which was mostly a large collection of Excel spreadsheets and paper. <laughs> so oh, I've replaced all of that, and all of it's in the system through Elixir and Phoenix now. Uh, ended up doing uh, things, uh, bringing in the other health departments like uh, radiation techs and EMS and all that kind of things. Uh, ended up... Uh, replacing the systems at the, um, like the gym check-in and so forth. Because uh, they didn't have any way of checking that someone was actually a student, for example. They just kind of took it on faith. <laughs> so 
So right. uh, I integrated the security system as well, which every student has to have a uh, photo ID card. Uh, and I can pull those IDs in real time to bring up pictures and so forth now so they can actually confirm that a person is actually who they say they are. So things like oh, that. Wow. It's just lots of little desperate, sy desperate systems that I've just been bringing together into one large interface. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So when it comes to, like, I guess it's a, you know, a web UI when it comes to viewing those pictures or looking students up, I mean, did you go the, the server-side rendered templates with like sprinkles of JavaScript or is this like an API backend with some you know, React or JavaScript front end? One of the requirements I had to do was that it had to work on very low-end browsers like Internet Explorer 10 to potentially even terminal-based browsers. So it is entirely backend template rendered but I use a, a surprising amount of JavaScript to make things faster and better. So if the JavaScript is well, then it progressively enhances itself very well. But if you have JavaScript completely killed, not a sign of it in your browser at all, the whole website, every bit of it still works. Just a little slower and less efficiently. Right. Wow, that's some pretty hardcore requirements. Like, it needs to work with links. And for anyone listening, that's a terminal browser. So who are the actual users of your app? I know, and by the way, for anyone listening, you know, we can't really go into super details of like where he works and things like that, but uh, are the end users basically um, employees of the university? They were initially employees. It started to expand to become some of the more citywide uh, health employees because they need to get back into the system to Because, for example, nursing students have to do their clinicals out in the city and the people that they're working under have to go back into the system to report things. So it started interacting with them as well. Uh, ended up adding in some student interfaces so that they can see their real-time grades and their requirements because they have to keep up with things like uh, vaccines and so forth uh, for, through those degrees. So uh, it's handling everyone's interfacing. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I mean, can you share a little bit about, uh, like if students are accessing this, are we dealing with like, low thousands of students, I guess, or somewhere in that neighborhood? At any given point of time, the most people I've ever had logged into the system at once was probably 80 or so, uh, not including the ones that are persistently uh, connected, like uh, the gym check-in terminals and things like that now. Uh, but the overall students, uh, how many do we have? I want to say we're a little over 2,000 students. Okay. So I think a lot of people underestimate, like, you know, 80 concurrent users is not a ton, but it's still like pretty decent amount of traffic. Like if you're trending on like the Hacker News front page, you might have maybe five to 600 concurrent users. So, you know, 80 is still like a non-trivial amount. And I do have Elixir things by no means professional whatsoever, hosting some of my own personal content and content for some open source projects I help manage that uh, they they've handled a significant amount more users, but they are entirely not what I would call professional. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned, uh, you know, server-side templates, progressive JavaScript. Are, are you using any features of Elixir in Phoenix, like Phoenix Live View uh, or anything like that, or channels even? I am using Drab, which predated Phoenix. I've been using Drab for a year before Live View came out. Uh, I tried to integrate Live View at one point, but it was missing some of the features I needed to be able to replace Drab. It might have it now. I need to look over it again. But um, Drab made it very simple to progressively enhance a page as well, because the page still functions without JavaScript. So, Right. I don't want to interrupt you there, but can you give like the TLDR for people who don't know what Drab is? Uh, Drab is another Elixir, li Elixir library. It came out a little more than a year before Live View. It initially was just a real-time socket between the user's page and the server uh, that initially just let you push the JavaScript across commands. Um, it would, its base set was like three functions uh, wrapping all of the stuff behind it, uh, which included uh, subscriptions and all of the other kinds of things. Fairly expansive. But uh, over time, more things were built up over it that included everything from jQuery helper libraries for simple use to an entire uh, templating system, .drab files instead of .eex, uh, plugged in via the standard normal Phoenix templating system. But those take the drab files, run them through Floki, so they have to be valid HTML and everything else like that. It parses the HTML, and it sees exactly where everything is. If you have text in a span that is 
uh, drabbed, it calls it, then uh, it will give that span a very unique ID on the page. And anytime you uh, change your assigns, and that would change, it sends just a very tiny little JavaScript command that tells it to update just that specific uh, element. So it doesn't need to reparse the DOM. So there's no morph DOM or anything else like that. It's very specific. Uh, but whenever Live View is announced, that kind of took the steam out of it. So it hasn't had a lot of development since then, but it's still working fine for now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I remember that one thread on the Elixir forum where the author of Drab was like, he didn't like get really upset, but it was like, now what, you know? Yeah, he lost a lot of his motivation for it. Uh, he handed off the reins from uh, managing it to me, and I've been keeping it updated and working since then, since I'm still using it. But if LiveView actually gets all of its functionality that I use at least, which is quite a lot, then I'll probably drop it for LiveView. But... So far, last time I checked, LiveView was still missing quite a few of its features. Yeah, I'm still looking forward to uh, handling like progress bar based uploads. That's like very hard to implement, you know. So once it's built into LiveView, that could be pretty nice. Yeah. Whereas what features draft, are you are you looking for? I actually do have an uploading thing like that for people uploading uh, like documents for like driver's licenses and so forth. Uh, and I actually do have a thing like that. It uh, just uses a little JavaScript library by default, but if you don't have JavaScript, it just does a normal form submission. But a JavaScript library brings it in, gives me a uh, base64 thing of it, which is then sent over via Drab and saved out to the server that way. So, <laughs> Hey, it works. So I guess maybe to switch gears from the front end stuff and you know live view and channels, uh, you mentioned the rest of your stack, you know, you have that Oracle backend, you have Postgres. Are you running any like, uh, are you running Redis or some type of cache backend or anything like that? All of that is done through the Beam itself. So for cache, I use CacheX library quite extensively. I have uh, four supervisors of it running, I think, uh, with different janitorial stats and all the things like that. Uh, the big one that's used of that is the permission system because I have extremely fine grained permissions you can kind of, well, if you've ever seen my permission EX library, it's based on that. But uh, the permissions are scattered throughout the database. So users will have permissions, groups will have permissions, some of the permissions will come from an LDAP server. Uh, yeah, I also talk with an LDAP server for authentication and so forth. Uh, as well as uh, certain groups or uh, in various other things. And it all combines that to build up their overall permission set, which is then stored in the cache database. That overall calculation takes a few hundred milliseconds, mostly waiting for the LDAP server. And I don't want that to happen on every single request. <laughs> so CacheX yeah. made that extremely simple to just do it. So I just have uh, I just ask CacheX for it. If it has it, it gives it. If it doesn't, it goes out, fetches all of the data, and then stores it while returning it to me. So that translates from, you know, 100 milliseconds plus down to pretty much effectively instant, right? Like a couple of milliseconds? The average page response time, uh, the Elixir console reports as being around like nine microseconds. <laughs> Jesus, microseconds too. Yeah, that is impressive. So are you also using, um, are you using Docker or no? Uh, it does all run in Docker. Uh, it's a fairly simple custom Docker thing. I've been meaning to learn Kubernetes and so forth, but I haven't got around to it yet. So it's a fairly simple Docker setup. It's very custom made. You know, for development, I assume you're using you're using Docker Compose, right? Uh, no? I'm actually using uh, what was it? Hold on a sec. Oh, yeah, Docker Compose. Okay, and then so that you know that's the development side of things. So you know, if another developer were to be working on your tech stack, they can basically just do you know like a Docker Compose up and then wait some amount of time, and it would be running. Is that how you have it set up? Essentially, except it's really it would be really hard to develop it anywhere it, off of the main network on campus, uh, and even then only on some subnets of the network, because for it to really work, it needs to be able to talk to that Oracle database, uh, because without it, there would be no information for it to really pull. <laughs> right. Yeah. And permissions in your line of work are pretty important. Yeah. The subnet restriction, I think there's four IPs that are allowed to access the Oracle database. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's locked down pretty well. So when it comes to production, then, I mean, are you using Docker in production as well? Correct. 
Yeah, it's uh, I just do a well. I have a little custom built Docker container, uh, which just takes uh, the it actually builds a uh, Erlang and Elixir in it. Then uh, it builds the program, does a release with mixed release, and then it copies that release into a new Docker image. So I'm using the built pattern, and yep. then it kills the old built image, and it just deploys that image and starts it up. So when you say starts it up, like are you also running? Are you using Docker Compose then in production as well, or no? Uh, well, I'm using it to build everything, but the actual image that's created uh, is just stored out, and that's just loaded straight via Docker itself. So okay. So then, are you are you also serving these requests straight up using uh, <clears throat> using Cowboy, or do you have like Nginx or something in front of it? I have Nginx in front of it only because it's proxying some other things, uh, uh, SSL certificates, a uh, some Wi-Fi endpoints, uh, a uh, weird DNS thing. <laughs> right. So when it comes to SSL certs, I imagine due to the restrictiveness of your platform, you're probably, I mean, are you using like Let's Encrypt or do you, do you just provide your own certificates? I'm just using Let's Encrypt for the public IP. There's both a public okay. IP and an internal IP. The internal IP, uh, they have their own certificate server, and I have a certificate through it for that. Okay, that makes sense. When it comes to serving assets and stuff like that, you just is that also going through Nginx as well? I plan for it to do that, but right now it's always just serving through Phoenix because it's fast enough I haven't cared yet. <laughs> yeah, it really is one of those things, right? It's like, unless you're really at scale, the the Cowboy server can be pretty good. Yeah. I compile things down into as few things as possible, so there's literally only a single JavaScript file and a single CSS file, and so those get cached very well, so the assets are almost never requested as it is. Right. And then for doing that asset bundling, are you using something like Webpack or something else? Uh, it's a custom build thing. I actually have a thread about it on the forums. Uh, I'm just using NPM itself as the build tool, so it just calls out to uh, the various things, so SCSS compiler and all that kind of stuff until it finally resolves down to the individual files. Interesting. And, he, and he's talking about the Elixir forums. Maybe I can drop a link to that in the show notes because I haven't even read that. So uh, Remind that me and I'll try to search for it on there. There's a okay. big thread on there about how to use NPM itself as the build system instead of needing to use Brunch or Webpack for anything. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I've never actually heard of that approach before. I'll definitely give that a read. It's popular in some communities. Uh, Webpack has gotten a lot better since then. Three years ago, Webpack was pretty garbage. <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, it's a lot better. If I were to make a new project, I'd probably use Webpack. Yeah, I think it was a smart move by the Phoenix team to default to using that nowadays. Yeah, Brunch back then was pretty good, but it just doesn't have a big enough community around it to really support it anymore. Right. I know a lot of your work is internal, but are you actually using some external like SaaS tools or, or things that you're your application depends on, like, you know, transactional email services like SendGrid or Mailgun, things like that? For Mail, I just uh, ferry it off to their Exchange server. I have my own comments about Exchange, but those are unrelated. <laughs> okay. And then what about things like uh, like error reporting or logging and metrics and all that fun stuff? Uh, that just goes down into a huge set of files I look at every morning, mostly. <laughs> if anything big happens, I get an email. Right. Yeah, that's the way I roll too. So it's like, you know, the logs are nice to have, but I'm not just looking at them. Unless something goes wrong, then I get notified. Yeah, I would like to use a better uh, statistics and error reporting and stuff like that server for telemetry. But uh, the only ones that I've really seen are mostly cloud-based that you can't really host yourself. And so they wouldn't really be useful since they don't have access to a lot of the things in there. And I'm not sure that they would really be allowed because they're not self-hosted. <laughs> right. I'm sure you're well aware of the telemetry library that comes with Elixir. And yep. uh, did That's you listen really to good. that? Did you listen to that one podcast with Chris McCord, who's the author of Phoenix, where he talked about in the or on the horizon, uh, they will be implementing some type of like web dashboard that's using that, so we can kind of get a live view based like metrics dashboard of what's going on in your Phoenix app. I didn't uh, hear the podcast, but I did hear about that being made, and that would actually be really nice. <laughs> yeah, so I know he talked about that a while back, like maybe a year ago or something like that, but this podcast was from a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully hopefully our definitions of on the horizon means within like maybe months instead of years. <laughs> I'd be looking forward. 
Yeah, because it is pretty cool, like to have that those metrics available to you, uh, just to go in there and be like, oh well, you know, when I load this page, like how many database queries are there, and how long are they taking to execute? Yeah, I, I like knowing stuff like that, even though it's like, not. I mean, it is super important for like, you know, figuring out the bottlenecks of your app, but it's just nice to know that it's there when you need it. Right now, I'm mostly just parsing the logs with a shell script bash. And so it just reads the log file and gives me a dump of various stats, how long the longest thing was, was it a a SQL query, things like that. Right. So are you actually logging out to straight up log files or are you taking advantage of things like systemd? I'm logging out to both systemd as well as I'm doing very specialized logging of certain metadata filtering to certain files as well. Okay. So we haven't really got to this yet, but um, I guess... Is it safe to assume that you're you're hosting everything on premises, right? Like your own bare bare metal servers. It started on a bare metal server, but it's been moved to a virtual server in 2017. So does somebody else in the organization manage those servers, or are you on the cuff for that too? It's pretty much me. It's not supposed to be me, but it's pretty much me. <laughs> All right. Isn't that fun though when you get to be the developer and the sysadmin? Uh, I have degrees in both, so I. Th- I think that's one of the reasons why they got me. <laughs> ah, so you actually went to some university for that specifically? I have an associate in IT, uh, mostly focusing on a lot of Cisco stuff and so forth. And then I got a, uh, a computer science degree with an emphasis in programming and a minor in electrical engineering. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Yeah, I'm sometimes envious of people who went to university. I never went, but... I imagine the social experience was really cool. I wasn't actually big on all the social stuff. In school, I was just trying to get in, get my degree, and learn. And honestly, I was really, really frustrated in school because there was very little learning. Hmm. That can be tough if you're a self-motivated learner. You can find so much online, and you can specifically learn what you want to learn. Yeah, and I was really the first generation that did that because I went to college way back in the uh, uh, early 2000s, tail end of the 90s. And so that was about the time when every when the knowledge of everything was starting to appear online. So I would go to class. We would learn a little bit of stuff. I was more curious in it. And that evening, I would read up on everything about it that they were going to teach on the next three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like we're almost probably pretty similar in age. I mean, I don't know if you want to out your age, but late 30s? Late 30s, yeah. Yeah. Almost 40. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to setting up these servers that you're pretty much handling yourself, uh, what distro did you choose? Oh, I always use Linux for everything everywhere. Uh, I tend to prefer Debian just because it's very well set and simple and most people know it well. My uh, current job, as well as my last job, both use Red Hat. So right now everything's hosted on Red Hat. Ah, so everything on Sun and Red Hat. Stuff I know very little about. <laughs> I've been using Debian for forever. Always choose Debian. There's, don't choose Red Hat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough to give an opinion on that, but, you know, Debian never really... There, nothing ever bad happened to the point where I was like, oh, I better look for something else. It's Honest, always been a good experience. Honestly, nowadays, every server I set up, which has only been one more in the past year, uh, it's a personal server. It's running Debian and everything is in Docker containers. So even the main OS doesn't really have anything on it. Right. Yeah, it almost becomes like just a shell for running some Docker application. So uh, if you can talk about this, like what are what are the hardware specs on those servers? Uh, the, um, well, like I said, it's in a virtual container right now. The virtual yeah. container has 40 gigs of storage, 8 gigs of RAM. Um, and it's allocated six CPUs, I think. I don't know why it's allocated six CPUs. It doesn't need that much by far, but it works well. Uh, the overall system that that's running on is 128 core with 128 gigs of RAM and 12 terabytes of storage, I think. So pretty beefy server, <laughs> I would say. It's also hosting the Oracle server and a lot of other things now too, though. The Oracle server, it eats so much resources. <laughs> really? So do you happen to know like offhand the ratios between like how much your uh, Phoenix application takes up versus the Oracle server? The CPU usage of mine never even 
moves. <laughs> the RAM usage is a couple hundred megs. Uh, the PostgreSQL server is about six or seven hundred megs, I think it was using last I checked. The Oracle server, in comparison, it's eating every bit of the 16 gigs of RAM it's allocated. <laughs> wow. So a, a couple hundred megs for the Phoenix app. Do you know, like, roughly, you're not going to probably know, like, the exact, like, line count of the app, but, like, how big is this application, like, generally speaking? Uh, in file space, or... I can yeah, like, into the how server. many lines of code, or something like that? Doesn't or... need to be exact. I mean, like, when it comes to... Are you using the Phoenix, like, context pattern, or no? Yeah, you would call it the context pattern. It's just what I've always done from Erlang way back in the day, but it's basically Phoenix's context pattern. Like, uh, like roughly, you know, like how many files are in that context directory, let's say? Oh, um, Like dozens or? I have it mostly separated by task. So like account handling is one directory. Uh, authentication is another directory. Uh, the nursing stuff is another directory that's massive on its own. <laughs> uh, there's, I think there's probably 14 top level directories. Okay. So, I mean, like, scope-wise, this app is pretty decently sized. Like, it's what you would expect after a couple of years of full-time development. And honestly, a lot of the files I should probably break up a little more because they just keep growing and growing. <laughs> so, a couple of the files, I probably shouldn't admit this, but are over, well over 2,000 lines long. <laughs> right. Yeah. That brings back to the PHP days of, like, 7,000 line file with SQL and JavaScript and CSS. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, those files are fairly simple. So they're just a lot of helper functions and accessing of the Oracle database or various specific handling of things. So each function is fairly compartmentalized. It would be easy to break it up. So. Yeah. So speaking of breaking things up and, you know, code styling and stuff like that, uh, do you find the code base nice to work with? Like when uh, management or something comes to you to add a feature or do some updates? Is it easy for you to find your way around? Oh, very. Um, navigating the code base is really easy. I've tried to keep a, a specific pattern of doing things. So anything reacting with front end is in its own stuff. Anything reacting with uh, the Oracle database is in its own subdirectory of trees, and those are broken up based on what tables are being accessed and what information is needing to be acquired and things like that. So generally, if a feature is needed, I know exactly what file to go to and what section to go to in it. Right. Yeah, that's a fantastic setup. Like, I love when projects work like that. And of course, it well predates the formatter. I'm not using the formatter right now. Um, I have the formatter formatting like 20 files right now, but the rest of the application isn't because the way I have the code structured is very Erlang-y, I guess you could say. And right. it, the formatter destroys the formatting of it. So it makes the code unreadable to me at that point. <laughs> Yeah, and for anyone listening, so Elixir has a built-in formatting tool that will just style your code in a specific way. And uh, it could be very nice, but it can also change things around a lot if you're not used to it, or, you know, if you, ha if you didn't use it initially. Yeah, if you didn't use it initially, it's pretty bad. I have been using it on pretty much all of my other projects. Uh, smaller ones that were old, I finagled them around so that they worked well with the formatter, but new ones, I've just been using the formatter straight out, and it's great for those. Um, I've tried a few times trying to get the formatter on this big project. It just doesn't fit well, just because all the code I would have to change to make it look readable again would, is too much for me right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like laughing in my own head, thinking about you running the formatter on the whole code base, and then just doing like 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 a git diff on that, it would probably be a big change. I've done that a few times just to see what things look like and so forth. Uh, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going back to, I guess, deployment a bit, um, are, are you provisioning these VMs uh, by hand or are you using configuration management tools like Ansible, Puppet, you know, things like that? Uh, it's something much, much worse. <laughs> uh, Uh-oh, let's hear it. It's one of those... Uh, packages that companies like to sell to people that don't really know and I forgot what it's called but it's built around uh, VMware's virtual sphere and virtual sphere on its own is annoying enough as it is and then all, having all this stuff on top of it is even worse. The only useful thing it does is the entire virtual system, everything in it is mirrored to an offsite location so if anything ever goes down we can swap it out really quick 
that's the only bonus it brings. Uh, working within it is a pain otherwise. <laughs> oh man. So that comes to, you know, setting up the server, but do you want to walk us through maybe like what like a, a typical deploy looks like? Like, you know, what type of commands are you running or like you get pushing stuff or etc.? A deploy is as simple as I type dot forward slash release dot sh, uh, wait for that to complete, and then on the production server, I just tell systemd to restart that one docker thing, and everything just works. It goes down for about two seconds. <laughs> oh, wow. Are you running your own private docker registry then, or do you just like build that on your dev box? And then let's push that over as like part of release. So I've actually never deployed an, an Elixir app, so I don't even know how releases work like in detail. I use a distillery to actually build the release. Um, I haven't touched it in a long time. It works, so I try not to touch it. But right. uh, distillery, it builds up its uh, own things. I initially uh, had it built with Docker, and it just deployed via systemd directly a long time ago. I actually have a thread about that on the forum as well for people that like to know how to do that. Uh, but even in Docker now, it just uh, builds using distillery. It makes a nice little compact release, and then you can take that release directory, move it somewhere else, in my case to another Docker image, and then just turn it on. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so deploying with Elixir is really simple, like ridiculously simple once you set it up. Setting it up can be a little interesting at times, but even that's fairly simple compared to other things I've dealt with in the past. <laughs> yeah, because I think Elixir... It has some stigma to it about deploying like, oh, it's so hard to deploy an application. Like I can't speak from experience because I haven't, but from the people who have, like you and some other people on the forums, it doesn't really seem like it's that that crazy. I do not have a horror story with Elixir deployments. I have a li horror stories with deployments of hundreds of other things by this point. <laughs> yeah. So uh, deploying with Elixir is good. That's high praise in the world of deployments. So before, you know, that new image and release gets set up, are you running, like, are you manually running a test suite or do you have like your own, like a Jenkins server or some CI server set up or no? Um, I ran Concourse for a while. I like the idea behind Concourse, but it was buggy. So I eventually ended up not. So it's pretty manually run right now, but I have a whole set of scripts that do everything for me. So to test, I have a dot forward slash test dot sh script and all that kind of stuff so i have scripts that have just automated everything for me at this point right yeah i like that because sometimes introducing like a full-blown ci server or setup is pretty complicated if like really all you want to do is like run a test suite build a docker image and push it somewhere potentially yeah people overthink things a lot of the time honestly shell scripts are perfect for so many tasks yeah, there's definitely a lot of over-engineering in places, and I'm guilty of it, too. Um, in my real life, though, I still use Concourse. Um, I deal with its bugs, but overall, it's an interesting system. Um, I keep intending to look at Drone, I think it is, but overall, still, I've been using Concourse in my normal real life. Right. I'd love to comment on that, but I actually don't even know what that is. <laughs> I've never used it. Concourse is a completely Docker-driven CI. So it's, it's a YAML file that you just build up steps and you bring in resources. So for example, in one of my real life projects, I have a Docker image that uh, it takes a, a, like a resource is a Git uh, URL, for example. So it will fetch that resource when it changes. And so whenever it changes, it fetches it. It mounts it into a new Docker container of my, in this case, it's a Java project. Uh, so it compiles the Java project, it builds up the whole cache, and then ferries it away into an object source server. And all of these are individual little tasks in Concourse. So you just thread together lots of little tasks. It's very nice. I'm not a fan of the YAML format. It's a little noisy, uh, but it's very nice for threading. It has a simple interface, but it really lets you see exactly what's happening in the system at that point. Right. Sounds I pretty cool. wish it was less buggy. Yeah, I'm a big fan of using Ansible. Uh, this is not related to CI, but in general, like Ansible, you're dealing with so much YAML files. Like I probably have written like 5,000 lines of YAML and you're right in that it can get pretty noisy, but it's not terrible, terrible. Well, but a lot of times like a shell for... script is what I would prefer. Yeah. Well, the YAML files for a concourse project can get huge. 
Yeah. Like how many lines are we talking? Like thousands or? Uh, give me just a sec. Also, while you're looking that up, so when you do a deploy, like how much actual downtime is there for each deploy that you do? Well, it builds up the a release, the image, everything else like that, and pushes it across, and it basically gets it ready. So at that point, everything's built, and it's ready to run. I tell the SysMD to restart the Docker stuff. That's another custom script of mine. Uh, it brings up the new Docker image uh, while simultaneously taking down the old Docker image and then swapping the socket across. Hmm, interesting. So then there's like very minimal downtime. There are better ways to do it where there would be no downtime, uh, but it would take a bit more programming work. Uh, it would be a little more finicky. Uh, and there just hasn't been a need for it. I just restarted at the end of the day. <laughs> right. Oh, so you're doing daily restarts then? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, generally every few days, depending on what's been done and what's being done. So speaking of that, uh, are you typically like committing new code on a daily basis then to the project? Oh, yeah. Sometimes? <laughs> yeah, I'm always editing something in it. So I guess like now that you know your application is deployed, it's up and running, you restart it every once in a while... So how have you planned for like disasters? Like, are you doing database backups, like backing up user data? Like, how do you deal with things like that? The Oracle database, I don't touch. They back that up themselves. Uh, the uh, code and everything, uh, that's stored uh, elsewhere. The uh, database, the PostgreSQL database, it's uh, backed up uh, every day um, to just a tar DZ file. It's not that big. Most of the data exists in the Oracle database. So, and then everything can be rebuilt if I need, just via deploying the Docker images again, so that's simple. But even that's not been needed because, uh, like I said, the virtual system is mirrored out uh, actively all the time. So even if that did go down, they would swap servers before even I could do anything. Oh, wow. So disaster recovery then is, is pretty handled pretty well. And it's been needed at one point. <laughs> uh, not on my stuff, but on other stuff. And it worked well for that. So <laughs> So do you want to share a little bit about that? Or like what happened to cause that? I'm not sure how much I can say, but to sum it up, Windows really sucks. And you really don't want Windows running anything important. <laughs> <laughs> right. I can at least say this since it's been in the news. A lot of colleges have been hit by uh, crypto viruses lately. Okay. That's related. <laughs> Interesting. On the topic of disaster planning and, and unexpected events, have you ever had like a malicious student try to do something like like, an, like a denial of service attack on, on your service in some way or no? Never seen anything of the sort yet. Uh, if anything, I've tried to denial service uh, the server. <laughs> uh, I like running uh, WRK and Siege and things like that on occasion just to make sure that everything's working properly. So I try yeah. to find some of the slowest points, which are like some of the report handlers. And yeah, it handles it fine. <laughs> so then you're not doing anything special at the app level then to do like throttling or like rate limiting certain endpoints? Not really. Yeah. The PostgreSQL database isn't really used for a lot of things, just storing extra data. Almost everything exists on the Oracle side. Uh, so there's not really a whole lot to hit on it because most of... It's just regurgitating what's in the Oracle database most of the time. <laughs> right. And just to rewind like a couple of minutes for people listening, uh, work and seed are command line tools that you can use to just throw heaps and heaps of traffic at your site and then get some cool metrics back. Like, you know, what's the 99% tile like latency and request per second and things like that. Pretty handy tools in your day to day. Yep. With work, I can, with a heavy seed using work, I can, um, uh generally get it to response times of up to around two seconds on some of the slower paths. So, but it keeps working. <laughs> yeah. And that's under like, basically, you know, really, really high load, like orders of magnitudes more than the typical usage, right? Yeah. And these are specifically paths that hits both databases like 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Cause a lot of other, well, it's not like every other technology is bad, but you know, some other technologies may just blow up at that point. So I guess, you know, we're getting pretty far into here, almost at 50 minutes. So do you have any advice for other people who are running similar stacks as you in production? Like, what are some of your best tips and lessons learned for running this whole entire app for two plus years? 
love Docker. Learn Docker very well. <laughs> that is one thing I cannot state enough. The reproducibility of images is amazing. Uh, because if anything happens, you can just roll back simply. Uh, you don't need to roll back your code and recompile. You can just roll back your Docker image. Um, as for the coding, love Dialyzer. Like, you want to dialyze everything. Um, I use Dialyzer probably excessively. <laughs> uh, Do you want to, sorry to interrupt again, but you just want to give a TLDR on Dialyzer just for people? Dialyzer is an uh, Erlang tool that comes with Erlang and thus Elixir. There's a uh, uh, Elixir project called Dial Elixir, which uh, wraps it around and gives it a very pretty Elixir interface. Highly recommended. It is a positive typer. What it does is a positive typer will try to confirm that the types given are correct, but it is not complete. So it catches a lot of issues, uh, but it doesn't catch everything. Uh, I would probably say 10 to 15% of what a full static typer would. However, Gradualizer is uh, coming out uh, soon, and it's effectively in beta right now. And that should catch the great majority of things. Like, it should be a 90% static analyzer. <laughs> so it will be very nice once it's finished. Yeah, that sounds like a, a very welcome thing to have. Yeah, just using those kind of things, and like even if you're using with Python nowadays, Python has static type, optional static typing now. You use static typing everywhere. Just the very act of typing your things, statically typing them, and using types everywhere. Like for example, if you're going to uh, get a user string and you uh, are going to validate it uh, for safety, that it doesn't include bad things and it does uh, the right things and etc. Whatever. Um, like for example, an HTML sanitizer. You don't want to validate, and I'm using air quotes, uh, the uh, string. You want to have a function that takes the string and returns a new type that happens to wrap the string. But, like, you can call it uh, HTML safe string. Just doing that and only having the things that accept HTML be safe is highly recommended because that right there will catch so many bugs that just won't make it into production at that point. Even Phoenix does similar things in this way. For example, the Phoenix templating system. Uh, if you have a string, it considers it unsafe. If you have a string inside a tuple with the first element as the atom safe, it considers it safe. Uh, anytime you uh, pass one of these strings to one of Phoenix's templating functions, it sanitizes it, cleans it, and it returns you back a safe tuple. Um, it's the same idea, just at compile time as much as possible. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that right there will prevent so many headaches down the line. A lot of people don't really think about maintenance in that way, but if this is something that's going to last at all, and you don't want to be dealing with weird issues happening over the years, use as much typing as possible. Yeah, totally agreed on that front, especially like the maintenance side of things. Like, you know, I don't know how long your app took to initially build, but maybe it was a couple of months, but you know, that initial build turns out to be years and years of maintenance. So being able to catch things at compile time is huge, huge time saver in the long run. Very much. <laughs> yeah. I guess one last question here is like, have you seen yourself make any mistakes in your code base that maybe you would like to reflect on, like for others potentially? Like how, how did you fix those mistakes? Or like pitfalls, stuff like that. There's been quite a number over time, which I've identified in fixed-ish, most of them. Um, a big thing is just keep the concerns more separate as possible. Like, it doesn't hurt to write another function. Keep the functions very short and simple. Keep them easily testable. Uh, write the types for them. The more you break things up, the easier everything is to test and repair and maintain. And Just don't make monolithic functions. Monolithic functions are much easier to deal with and strongly typed languages like Rust, C++, Ocaml, and so forth. But in something like Elixir, you want to keep things as tiny as possible. Yeah, I, lo I love that because it, it definitely is way easier to maintain, you know, a four or three line function than a 30 line one. Even if you, even if, even if you end up with like 30% more lines of code because you have 10 of those, like small ones. Very much. <laughs> Yep. So Gabriel, you know, thanks so much for uh, coming on the Running in Production podcast. You know, it was really great talking to you. It was very fun. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah. So before we wrap this up, uh, do you have any links that you want to share? Maybe to like your personal site or GitHub profile, Twitter account, things like that? Uh, pretty much everywhere. I'm OverMindDL1. O-V-E-R-M-I-N-D-D-L-1. So if anyone wants to look at my projects on GitHub, I'm OverMindDL1 there. Um, I was dead on Twitter for a long time, but I actually posted my first thing on it about typing <laughs> uh, just today for the first time in months. So if you want a very low message Twitter, you can follow that if you want. Uh, otherwise, I'm mostly just active on IRC, both Esper and Freenet, or Freenode. So if anyone ever wants to message me, feel free to hop on IRC and message over my DL1. Nice. Yeah, I'm on IRC too. So we are in the Elixir channel if uh, anyone wants to learn more about that. And uh, thanks again, Gabriel. And on that note, to everyone listening, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. You've been listening to the Running In Production podcast. You can find a full archive of the show at runninginproduction.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe using your favorite podcast player or leave a review if you like the show.